My name is Aka Semi Newsom, and I'm the Associate Director of the Institute of European Studies at UC Berkeley. On behalf of the Institute and our partner, the Pacific Regional Office of the German Historical Institute, I would like to welcome you all to the first lecture this spring in our German and European history series at our Institute. Today, we will hear from Professor Paul Betts about his new book on Europe after 1945, Ruin and Renewal, Civilizing Europe After the Second World War. Professor of History, John Connolly will moderate the discussion. Now these lectures would not be possible without the generous support of Mrs. Norma von Ragenfeld Feldman and the German Academic Exchange Service, both of whom we thank. A few housekeeping details. This event is being recorded. And after the lecture, audience members are welcome to enter their questions into the chat. Please do keep your questions brief and to the point. Now about our speaker. Uh, Professor Paul Betts teaches modern history, modern European history at St. Anthony's College, Oxford, and is the author of several books. Most recently, as I mentioned, Ruin and Renewal. And he's also co-edited seven additional books, including with Jennifer Evans and Stefan Ludwig Hoffman, The Ethics of Seeing, Photography, and 20th Century German History in 2018, and with Steve Smith, Religion, Science, and Communism in Cold War Europe, which came out in 2016. And then from 2014 to 2018, he was co-investigator of a four-year AHRC-funded collaborative project on Socialism Goes Global, Connecting the Second and Third Worlds, from which a co-edited volume with James Mark on Red Globalism will appear with Oxford University Press in 2021. I now will give the floor to Paul. Thank you so much, Paul, for joining us. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sammy. That's a very kind introduction. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you very much to Stefan Ludwig Hoffmann uh, and the History Department at UC Berkeley, along with uh, Heike Friedman from the German Historical Institute. And special thanks to uh, John Connolly for agreeing to serve as a commentator tonight. Um, I've been asked to give about 20 minutes or so as a kind of overview of some of the main points of the book, and I'm happy to do that. Um, this book is in many ways a kind of history of Europe since 1945 that takes stock of the kind of arc of events on the continent since the end of the war 75 years ago. It aims to reconsider the remaking of Europe from the ceasefire to the present. Um, now, of course, as many of you know, the history of Europe uh, after 1945 is a crowded field. And many other distinguished historians that have been uh, in, in working through the field, Tony Judd, uh, Ian Kershaw, uh, Conrad Yalish, just to name a few. And we're generally familiar with the story of Cold War division and stabilization in both blocks, economic recovery and uh, political reconstruction. And in this book, what I've tried to do is in a sense, take a different approach in many ways in two ways. The first is to try to integrate uh, key themes that have been left out of many of these other books. And that includes religion empire, decolonization, race, and heritage debates. But this is not really just an issue of adding these themes and stirring. It's an effort to think about these themes as an effort to kind of reconsider the place of post-war Europe in the wider world. And that way try to uh, include both Eastern and Western Europe, as well as Africa. As a matter of fact, it's a chapter on Ghana, Algeria, and Senegal and the effort was to see how these countries kind of recast European-African relations uh, from a post-imperial perspective. The second point, in a sense, the red thread I use to track is to track these debates and actions associated with the defense of civilization. Uh, the book in that way explores how changing views of civilization led to a new politics of identity in an era of defeat, uh, division, and the end of empire. In fact, it was the very fallibility of European civilization that stirred a diverse set of thinkers, politicians, activists, and reformers to try to rescue it from the ruins of war and moral destruction. And after all, civilization and crisis touched on the great issues of the day, war and peace, religion and science, empire and anti-imperialism, communism and anti-communism. It was a key concept for describing in making sense of post-war Europe and its changing place in the world. So in that way, civilization was not an abstract or theoretical question, but rather cut to the heart 
of who Europeans thought they were and wanted to become. So we're generally familiar with the story of the kind of rise and fall of great civilizations historically, but we have less understanding of how civilizations, uh, a civilization was destroyed and then rebuilt. And 1945 in Europe provided such a moment of physical and moral collapse. So it's not just a Europe that saw itself as the measure of civilization for the world that turned into its barbaric opposite. I mean, that's certainly true. The question that I found more compelling is how did it recast itself and what did people want to preserve? In other words, which values and traditions were rehabilitated as compass and direction? How did Europeans themselves narrate the continent's ruin and renewal in a world of political division, foreign and military occupation, and superpower influence. So in that way, the book returns to the physical moral ruin of 1945 as a kind of moment of reckoning and opportunity. In that way, Europe was a laboratory of contested heritage after the war. So on one hand, the kind of mission to re-civilize Europe was linked to peace and even progressive leftist causes. And by that, I mean pacifism, welfare state policies across the Iron Curtain, anti-colonialism, and multiculturalism. But on the other hand, uh, the idea of kind of rebooting and restoring civilization was also closely linked to conservative and reactionary countercurrents, the defense of empire, militant Christianity, racism, and anti-immigration. So in that way, the book was trying to keep those kind of twin elements of the uh, kind of uh, inheritance of Europe civility and violence both are kind of firmly in place. Now I imagine for some of you listening, uh, this is kind of a strange departure point. Um, Tony Judd, for example, is not alone in saying that Nazism and the Third Reich's genocidal war rendered European civilization the grandest of all illusions. Civilization, of course, is a term we love to hate. Uh, we often put scare quotes around it or or in a sense qualify it with so-called, all in a sense gestures of moral distance and disapproval. And there's of course good reason for that. Uh, civilization carries a very heavy and unwanted historical baggage of 18th century elitism, 19th century imperialism, war, and racism. Uh, this kind of antipathy was nicely summed up by Mahatma Gandhi when he supposedly was asked at one point what he thought of Western civilization, and then he famously quipped, Western civilization sounds like a good idea, meaning it's a story of kind of brutality and hypocrisy. Now, since the 1970s, the language civilization has become more and more commandeered by the right, often against immigration. And we're also familiar with the way civilization's been used as kind of crude shorthand for understanding the roots of post-Cold War conflict. We think of Samuel Huntington's famous book, 1996, on the clash of civilizations, which people are members of so-called unchanging regional blocks that's driving the political antagonism of the 21st century. And today, of course, we see the word being uh, invoked in a range of different ways. Um, figures like Viktor Orban, when he characterizes the refugees from Syria and Libya as an assault on Europe's Christian roots and uh, Europe's civilization. So with echoes, of course, across Europe and North America these days. And we shouldn't forget, of course, the racist ramping up of the term uh, in recent years, uh, the, the Unite the Right uh, rally in Charlottesville in 2017, and then the killing at the mosque in Christchurch, New Zealand, which the uh, the, the killer in that case, if you looked at his online manifesto, said he was carrying out these heinous acts in the name of white civilization. So the tagline of civilization in crisis is everywhere in the 21st century, but we don't have much of a sense on how this came about or how this changed uh, since 1945. So in that way, the point is that the political language of civilization did not die at Auschwitz. On the contrary, reemerged as a central metaphor to describe positive meaning to physical and moral reconstruction after the war. So the book gives voice to the many people engaged in the reconstruction fever across the Iron Curtain and in various ex-colonies in the name of renewal and reform. So included among them were warmongers and peaceniks, preservationists and liberal modernizers, scientists and humanitarian aid workers, Christian conservatives and Eastern European communists, as well as European imperialists and African anti-imperialists. 
Now, some of them saw civilization as singular and universal, others as plural and separate. But all parties identify the contest for civilization as urgent and necessary. And in fact, it was the elasticity of the term and the language that in a sense provided its power. Now, um, what I found especially striking is that after 1945, the whole discussion uh, was much broader than ever before, as well as much less elitist and even Eurocentric, as various advocates and critics invoke civilization as synonymous with peace, expanded welfare states, social solidarity, and even refined everyday interaction. Also interesting, I felt, is that civilization moved beyond an abstract idea and encompassed a broad array of practical reform initiatives to begin anew. So this is a story in which is not just about elites talking, but actually how civilization became a set of practices to remake Europe and Europeans. So that could include anything from humanitarianism to international justice to military occupation. And let's not forget that the language of civilization was central in the idea of remaking Germany and the Germans um, after the Second World War. We could also see this with uh, cathedral restoration, welfare state provisioning, and the peace movement, for example, as well as in things like uh, the mass production of etiquette book writing about the proper comportment uh, and the civilization of the self, as it was called. Now, the book begins uh, with the humanitarian aid workers in 1945, and I was kind of interested in showing the kind of things they were doing on the ground, and they became uh, a kind of set of forgotten but very, very important early rebuilders and narrators of post-war Europe in ruin. So in that way, post-war Europe played host to competing claims over what civilization was and could be after Nazism, the war, and empire. Um, I found that civilization is the most cherished of invented traditions, and its invocation was often present or most present in times of danger and disorder. It was a go-to term that enabled people to think about the place of Europe beyond the nation state, Cold War division and empire, and put forward a politics of identity based on a redrawn relationship between European past and present. So in that way, ideas of civilization therefore carry with them conceptions of time and space that embedded collective experiences of radical upheaval in imagined historical pasts and geographically bound identities. Now, I have a few minutes left, so I'd like to talk about some of the things that really surprised me along the way in the research. One is that we um, generally think of the idea of civilization as solidifying po uh, Cold War divisions. Now, it was certainly the case for the idea of the, uh, the uh, defense of Christian civilization as kind of marker between East and West, but they're also really important bridges uh, across the uh, Iron Curtain, and that became things like uh, the, you know, the, uh, the agitation against atomic weaponry in the name of planetary civilization, uh, you know, the importance of the peace movements and the idea of the civilization of science, uh, organizations like uh, you know, CND and kind of pugwash, as well as in things like uh, housing, um, ideas of the family, and what I found interesting is the you know, dangers about the coming of American civilization. Uh, that was actually very, very strong on both sides of the uh, Iron Curtain. Also interesting and surprising to me was the way that language resurfaces in Eastern Europe. Now, uh, we, for the most part, the language civilization was confined to Western Europe uh, from the kind of 40s to the 60s, but there's also kind of an important element in Eastern Europe as well. Now, we generally know that the, the term was uh, for the most part dismissed as uh, associated with Western imperialism. Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin all kind of used the term in various ways at, at, on occasion, but it's certainly not as, as strong or important one. It does resurface then during the Second World War as the Soviets interested in building an alliance with the West against what they call Nazi barbarism in the effort to save the civilization. It also resurfaces during the Nuremberg trial with the idea that the Allies are putting forward a, an effort to put the uh, Nazi leaders in the dock. So that becomes important. But what I found really striking is that the kind of neologism of socialist civilization becomes an important language of equality and anti-imperial fraternity, often as a kind of bridge language to connect Eastern Europe uh, and Africa and Asia around these concepts. So the idea of social civilization becomes an important kind of um, term to link the second and the third world 
and often linked to uh, Eastern European uh, kind of soft power initiatives and folk festivals and archaeology projects to fortify the links between Eastern Europe um, and Africa in, in the name of international socialism. Also uh, interesting to me was the, how the term resurfaces in or among uh, African national elites uh, and how key national leaders, for example, Kwame Kruma in Ghana and Leopold Seda Singer in Senegal use this language of civilization to kind of turn the tables on their former uh, European masters. So we think of civilization as being the most of European ideologies, but then was used in very political ways to advance an idea of African civilization. Now, certain figures like Fanon and Césaire, of course, always wanted to dismiss the term as an unwanted part of the European inheritance, what they call the, they often talk about um, imperialism as the kind of decivilization of Europe, uh, Césaire makes that quite clear. But others, as I was mentioning, will use the term and not, they don't actually reject the term outright, but rather put forward an idea of civilizations as being multiple and equal, and that no continent, least of all Europe, enjoyed a monopoly or an advanced position. So the idea, the assertion of African civilization becomes a kind of language of post-colonial arrival and sovereignty. And also, also tracking the ways in which the language becomes very important during the Algerian wars. Both the French and the Algerians are using the language of civilization and barbarism, and often through graphic photography as a way of making a case uh, to the international community about the uh, justness of their particular cause, often around the discussions of torture, for example. So in this way, the book seeks to show how a wide set of practices associated with re-civilizing the continent reflected the changing hopes and fears of post-war European, post Europeans themselves. So on offer is the kind of history of Europe from 45 to the present that places the, um, the custody battles over its damaged and disputed heritage center stage. In this way, the book seeks to show how the wide set, the wide set of practices associated with Recivilizing the continent reflected a multiplicity of political storylines in which Europe was culturally reimagined and reorganized both on the continent and abroad. So now I, yeah, um, this is John Connolly speaking um, from Kensington, California, uh, north of Berkeley. Um, uh, so I've been asked to say a few things and then I'll open um, the floor for discussion. Um, so when I first heard the title of the book and the general topic, I thought, well, here's going to be another take on the early post-war years. We'll hear a bit about Christian democracy and the coal and steel union, uh, other events, the, the 30 glorious years uh, of the immediate post-war years that we've heard about before. And then I opened the book. And it's a completely different take on post-war Europe. I was astounded um, to, to, to be reading about, um, well, most of the, much of the book actually takes place outside of Europe. It takes place in Africa um, and the United States where Stanford University at one point in the book with Jesse Jackson protesting <laughs> against Western civilization. Um, there is very, severe, very serious concern about issues uh, of transition between war and post-war toward one, what one might call civilization. There are great episodes about uh, the po early post-war trials, also the, uh, the aid um, efforts that um, Paul just, just mentioned. Um, lots of inter in interesting uh, discussion of post-war repatriations, deportations. East and West are together. So it's interesting that it's, it, it's Europe and really both Europe's throughout the book, but it's then, then you know, as, as Paul said, it's, it's more than Europe. Um, so it's, it's, it's unlike any, any book on Europe that I've encountered and uh, it reads extremely well um, for those of you who haven't, haven't had a chance to look at it yet. And, and, and I recommend that you, you, you get a copy um, and, and, and survey the arguments. Um, maybe just one general comment um, in terms of a course that I'm doing right now, which is on the history of democracy, uh, which focuses on Europe and goes back really to the middle ages. Uh, a point that's made by Francis Fukuyama is that liberal democracy as we understand it in the West and as a product of the West was not intended by anybody. It sort of emerged over many centuries through conflict and, and in fact, sometimes genocidal conflict to, to produce what we recognize as being liberal democracy and a tradition of rights, but nobody really was behind it. It happened, so the Western tradition happened without anybody 
imagining or wanting or desiring the Western tradition, right? And the reason I say this is because uh, it's pretty clear in, in Paul's book that there's there's a real there's a real subject here, but nobody really intended it, or thought of it, or in, you know, or wanted it in a way. It sort of emerged by its own, and it emerged from several quarters, right? From from the New United Nations, which, by the way, Paul also talks about the founding moment of the United Nations. But it's 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 Western Europe. It's conservative, but it's it's also social democratic, socialist, and then it's Eastern European. It's something the Soviets want to embrace. Nobody can let it go. Right, so that's that's what that's why it's a topic because so many di competing entities want it to be a topic, uh, and 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 so you know one one, one can't ignore it. Um, so I have two questions re related to that to that comment, which is, um, Paul, when you were you've been reading on these matters for years, and some of these the, these uh, specific issues go back to earlier concerns. When was it, and how was it that you decided that there had to be a book about this? Right, that you figure that there's actually a, there's something missing uh, in in Jut and Mazar and other, other histor histories of Europe, and this is this is the way to go at it. And another question I had is that there's a competing term that you, comes 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 through occasionally, but also in the last sentence of the book, which you call a cousin of civilization, which is humanity. And I'm wondering why you didn't decide to devote the book to humanity, because in some ways it's less objectionable. Um, civilization immediately you you run into the objections you've talked about, which is that people can say that it's 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 a it's a cover for barbarism in some ways. It's a cover for imperialism. It's a cover for a lot of agendas that that are unholy, and and unwholesome, right? And that have led to a lot a lot of suffering. Whereas humanity it seems doesn't really have that problem, and it's also shared a, across boundaries. I think, I think even from Vatican II, the Catholic Church, in a sense, would embrace it. Why not? Why not humanity? I'm not. I'm not questioning your decision to go for, for civilization, but maybe you could lay out your, your thinking about why you chose that and not not alternate. So those would be kind of a pair of twin questions. And then, um, um, if anybody, by the way, has a question from the audience, we'd like to ask you to put it in the chat, and then I will I will pose it uh, to Paul, and and uh, we'll hear Paul's thoughts. So so Paul, please you. Thank you. Um, I'll start with the first question, which is about you know the issue of democracy. I mean, I think. You're right in that um, that's a lot of work. I mean, I was thinking of Martin Conway's new book also on uh, kind of the stabilization of, uh, of Western Europe and how democracy in a funny way was not all that democratic, a kind of a regime of, of technocratic elites uh, in the sense of kind of driving forward a, 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 a whole set of issues. Now, it's in many ways, it runs partly in parallel with something like democracy. We think of all the democracies and one of the uh, issues after 1945 is in a sense battle over adjectives, right? So it's, you know, it's, it's Christian democracy, it's liberal democracy, it's Western democracy, it can be, um, uh, you know, uh, socialist democracy in terms of how people use that qualifying adjective to kind of drive forward a political agenda. But um, as people have argued, there was a sense, especially after 1945, that democracy didn't have very deep roots uh, in Europe. And I think civilization was in many ways then invoked as a way of giving people a much uh, more grounded sense of the relationship between kind of past, present, and future. In a sense, it gave them a kind of historical grounding that I think the language of democracy at the time didn't. It was much more present-minded uh, in terms of its, uh, per, you know, its uh, particular political role. So that was one in which I, there's a quite a bit of, uh, not quite twinning, but at least mirroring in terms of a time civilization seems to run up very closely to an idea of a kind of expression of democracy. Other times it seems to, um, to you know, in a sense, uh, justify authoritarianism and racism or very exclusive politics. So it really kind of depends on the moment and the, um, and the controversy. The question about the organization of the book, I mean, I have been thinking about this for quite a long time. And like a lot of books, it was kind of born of, of dissatisfaction toward um, toward the field in terms of how are uh, valuable and uh, and important a lot of those books on post 45 have been the absence of some of those key themes which may not have mattered 15 20 even 30 years ago let's say issues of religion and and uh, empire and decolonization I just it seemed to me it was more and more impossible to talk about the post 45 story without in a sense factoring those in so that was in a sense the first impulse to try to think of what the integration of those themes might mean for a new uh, history of Europe. But civilization to me was, it was a term that um, 
it's a lot of discussion, of course, reading out the last rites of civilization when it actually died, when it died at Verdun or died at Auschwitz or, or Algiers. It's, it's a cottage industry about proclaiming the death of civilization. But if you actually look at the uh, political commentary, the kind of cultural criticism, the discussion, the intellectual thought, uh, from 45 to you know, all the way to the present. It's actually a term that's absolutely everywhere. And I was trying to get a sense of what people meant by it. Now, I think this um, would have been a shorter book, maybe uh, you know, a more manageable book if I had just written a kind of intellectual history. Uh, you know, and there are lots of discussions of, uh, among intellectuals in terms of uh, what, would be, you know, what was the enlightenment heritage after 1945. But I really wanted to take this into the world of action and uh, practical initiatives and to, in a sense, capture the world of housing officials and uh, public health uh, experts and etiquette book writers and archaeologists and architects to see that they're also working with a very similar vocabulary. And what did they actually mean when they talked about the idea of either re-civilizing Europe or building a new material civilization? So in that way, I was trying to kind of capture the the variety and the kind of richness of the term and that it could be used and uh, summoned to justify a range of different political agendas. So the, the hardest part of the book in many ways was to try to find those nine chapters, uh, those kind of case studies or controversies in which I, I could use them to do the work to in a sense illustrate a particular point because I was never interested in doing a kind of engram analysis in which you just look at the linguistic usage. I mean, lots of people use the term in, you know, in journalism and academic life and that, you know, that to me wasn't uh, very interesting. I wanted to see where it would kind of cluster or it would kind of arise around a particular problem. So that could be around military occupation, around humanitarianism, about religion, about, uh, you know, again, issues of, uh, of housing, could be issues of empire. And so it took me a while to, in a sense, identify those particular themes as kind of hooks on which I could hang this broader discussion. And originally I was thinking of kind of finishing the story around 1970 in a kind of a more conventional way. And then publishers are really pushing me hard to take this up to not just the end of the Cold War, but actually into the 21st century. And that was actually much more rewarding than I thought it would be in terms of um, seeing how the term really drifts to the right and uh, in a sense plotting out how in fact that had happened. So it was one in which I was really trying to think about the kind of sweep of European history over 75 years, as John was saying, kind of East and West, and then in a sense uh, why Africa became at various points a kind of key counterpoint, uh, both at the kind of restoration of empire at the end of the Second War, and then in terms of how that language is used by African national elites to in a sense turn the tables in terms of advancing idea of civilization, which is in part uh, an effort to uh, kind of renegotiate the relationship between Europe and their former colonies. So um, that's in a sense what I was kind of trying to do. And the departure point was really typically kind of not just a dissatisfaction with other books, but also trying to think of why the word became such a powerful one in the kind of wake of 9-11, which it did. I mean, uh, all the, the number of Bush, Bush speeches about the idea that uh, the need to save civilization. Uh, and that's become a kind of running theme. And Trump himself, we've kind of long forgotten, uh, you know, he gave a speech in Warsaw in 2017, in which he talked about the idea that Poland serves as the kind of Eastern flank of Western civilization and the importance of, of kind of, um, of, of uh, advancing to the defenses. So the language is something that's been used mostly by Republican presidents in the US and then by a range of kind of right-wing politicians for very dangerous and often very racist ways. But I was trying in the book to show the kind of um, the wide open sense after 1945 in which a number of leftists and liberals were also very keen on using the term to advance a politics and why in a sense they, with time, especially in the 1970s, they abandoned the term uh, to the right. Um, so maybe your book will cause the left to reclaim or at least become more interested in this term of civilization. I think that would be a good thing. So we have about a half hour and we have uh, six or seven questions. So I will read the first question and uh, hope we can get through as many as possible. So we have a provocative question from Robert Heller. He says, should the Africans and Asians be grateful to Germany for essentially ending the imperialism of France and England and paving the road to their independence? Kind of an ironic question. Thank Germany for what? Sorry, I missed that part. Yeah, I'll read it again. Um, should the Africans and Asians be grateful to Germany for ending the imperialism of France and England, I guess, through the Second World War and paving their road 
the road to their independence. So this is kind of an unintended consequences sort of question. Uh, I, you know, I, I see that, and I, it is kind of an ironic question. I can't imagine that the, the elites in those countries would be very happy with that. I mean, this is one in which it was a kind of hard fought and kind of bloody uh, struggle uh, to kind of kick the Europeans out and in the name of kind of national independence and political sovereignty. Um, so in that way, no, I don't really think it's an issue of kind of gratitude so much as been one about seizing control. But I was, I was interested in terms of how that language, which again was dismissed by a number of um, what we generally think of as anti-colonial intellectuals, again, Cézanne and Fanon, uh, rejected that term, and, but you know that's that's an important story in itself. But how many others actually thought there's something in it uh, that we we meaning African elites can use uh, in terms of uh, uh, kind of expressing a very very different kind of political identity? So I was I was surprised as how live a term it still was from the 1950s through the 1970s. But again, I think in Africa for a range of different reasons, it, it also partly disappears. Um, so that's, in a sense, it's a kind of moment of a kind of efflorescence around the term, and then it moves and migrates uh, into the kind of rhetorical uh, property of other groups. But um, that, you know, that decolonization moment, I think is very, very important. And I certainly wanted to make that a big part of European history, not just to say that somehow it was in the cards in 1945, but to say, um, this is one that was forced on them and their restoration of empire after 1945 suggests that uh, they were very keen to kind of win back lost territory, often using the old 19th century language and civilization to justify imperial conquest. It just, of course, uh, you know, they were kind of beaten back. We shouldn't kind of forget that those uh, motivations and impulses were there and that kind of language was used to justify uh, uh, military uh, intervention. Okay, uh, the next question. Can you expand on how Kwame Nkrumah used the concept of civilizing in the Ghanaian independence struggle? I mean, I think for someone like Krumah, I might find it very interesting is that he, like a lot of African political leaders after decolonization were trying to think, what does a post-imperial African nation look like? And so he uses this idea of, we need to break from the uh, influences of European, in this case, you know, British civilization. And so he becomes one of the key uh, champions of this idea of African civilization, along with Senghor and a number of Thioré, a number of other key intellectuals and, uh, and politicians. What I found interesting is that because of the situation in Ghana, which is quite complicated in terms of a range of different regions and kind of tribal rivalries, uh, with the Ashantis and the Gaz and the rest, he had a difficult time in sense inventing an idea of Ghanaian national identity. Um, you could see this in the discussion about the uh, the National Museum, for example, in Accra that was opened in 1957, a few weeks after national independence, uh, in which a number of tribal leaders didn't want to lend their objects to this museum because they thought that he was driving forward a kind of nationalist and even socialist uh, agenda. So I think in that way, African civilization for figures like Krumah and partly also for, for uh, uh, Senghor became a kind of way of dodging the more difficult issue of, let's say, talking about Ghanaian civilization or Senegalese civilization to, in a sense, make it a continental issue is one in which it became an umbrella term that they could advance a whole range of kind of national politics. That was, in a sense, some, I went to, uh, did some research in Accra and uh, was really, in a sense, digging through some of the materials, older uh, speeches from Kruma, and also in terms of his effort to try to build a new national identity. Um, outside the kind of shadow of British power and often using this language of civilization as a way in a sense of suggesting that the Ghanaians have arrived, should be taken seriously and have actually achieved a great deal. So he also like other, some of these other leaders will sponsor a number of archeology span projects uh, to in a sense, literally unearth kind of ancient uh, African empires. Uh, the same fact, uh, it kind of uh, tell the story about uh, the kind of proud and important heritage long before a European arrival. Next question comes from Matthew Spector. Um, does your book explore the topic of EEC, EC, EU membership and whether criteria of civilization become factors in the expansion of Europe? I'm thinking of Gerd Gong's argument about how the standard of civilization was used as a criterion for entrance to international society in the late 19th century. Uh, that's a good question. Um, one of the stories that I'm telling here, I think it's part of the reason why it's not been picked up by other historians, and most people, especially when thinking about the 18th and especially the 19th century, 
use international law as a kind of, as the yardstick for measuring ideas of civilization. And certainly civilization drops away from being a key issue of international law uh, from the uh, late, late 40s, early 50s, but it moves into other spheres. And so I think that's part of the reason that people wanna track that. I was looking for more material on this and the kind of founding of the uh, European Coal and Steel Commission, the EEC, and then eventually morphing into the EU in terms of the language of civilization. I, I mean, there's some of that in terms of the values of peace, um, tolerance, uh, tolerance, the rule of law, uh, you know, uh, peaceful commerce, et cetera. But it's not, it wasn't really as present as I thought it'd be. I think that was, I think, I think for a lot of people in Brussels, there's a sense in which that language was so tied up with European imperialism and their effort to turn the page on that particular past. I think they were reluctant and slightly suspicious about using that language, but they would certainly use what often ends up a kind of a substitute language when you're talking about European, let's say African affairs, they use a language of development um, as a kind of more politically correct term uh, when they're talking about that interface. But I didn't really see very much of that. And I did look quite hard. It could be that uh, I, I might've missed some things, but it's certainly not central to the kind of self-identity um, of, the, of, the, of the kind of, you know, the uh, burgeoning union at the time. Uh, it's much more the ideas of kind of uh, peace, prosperity, um, cooperation, sharing resources, that in a sense are much, much stronger. Uh, and issue, eventually issues of kind of rule of law, which come much later in the 1970s. So here's a basic question from Arian Deora. How exactly would you define the term civilization? Do you think it has a set meaning or that it can mean different things to different peoples? Uh, good question. I, I certainly spent some time in the introduction trying to define it as best I could, but um, the book is really about how it's, it's an abstract and quite elastic and slippery term, but that in a sense gives it its power that people can, everybody thinks, you know, for example, the British art historian Kenneth Clark uh, opened this very famous 1969 television series for BBC in which you know, he's a very prominent art historian. He says, you know, what is civilization? He says, actually, I can't define it. It's very abstract, but I know it when I see it. Uh, and not everybody was very content with that kind of breezy, you know, kind of patrician idea that he, he could recognize that, but he kind of put the, his finger on the problem of identification. And so the book is not really about any fixed uh, definition, is in a sense how people, you know, uh, identify, seize it, use it. I was much more interested in the way it functions as, a, as an ideology, really, to justify a range of, of political action. I mean, again, we think of it as a kind of, you know, set of beliefs, a kind of a inheritance about, um, uh, you know, cultural achievements from the past. It has, a, it's a range of things. It's actually very difficult to define. And I was looking at other historians that have tried, people like uh, Arnold Toynbee and Lucien Febvre and a range of others. And I, I, they, you know, they, they're also quite slippery in terms of being fully aware that it does change. Uh, over time and across context. So I, in a sense, made my peace with the fact that it's not a kind of um, fixed set of, uh, of definable terms, but it's actually, it's the kind of, the slight open, open nature quality, the kind of uh, elasticity, the, the, um, the flexibility of it that actually made it a very powerful one in which people could draw on it to, in a sense, drive forward with a range of different kind of ideas and ideologies. Well, I don't know if you've encountered this 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 uh, this statement by uh, Joseph Conrad. He said civilization was the thin crust of barely cooled lava. No, I have beneath our feet. No, and I didn't. I actually didn't see that. He also I mean, he's, traveled, he's traveled across continents. Um, there's a related question from Anna, Anna Holian. Um, can you explain how you put boundaries around your exploration of the concept of civilization? It would seem to be a term used quite unevenly across Europe, what consequences does, does this unevenness have for what is included and excluded? Um, like I said, I basically, uh, my choice was, because the topic in many ways is so such a big one, uh, it meant that I had to make very strong personal choices in terms of what was in or out. Um, there are certain things that I thought would be in there that weren't as strong and or I didn't have time to uh, to explore them. I mean, one, for example, I was thinking of having a kind of discussion of the death penalty uh, and the idea of the uh, abolition of the death penalty in Europe is in a sense a kind of step toward civilization. That didn't quite happen, but I was um, 
to me, I was interested in for IR people, international relations people, they almost always think of civilization as being a bounded concept. It's about a bounded political community. And I think that does work at times, especially in terms of uh, religion. People talk about a kind of idea of a Western or Christian civilization has clear demarcated boundaries. Um, I was, and that does work, and that was, and it's certainly there in the book, but there are other moments in which it's um, about how, you know, civilizational thinking is about um, exceeding or transcending boundaries. I mean, what I found so interesting about Arnold Toynbee, in a sense, probably the most, most famous uh, thinker about civilization, and, uh, you know, his Christian framework didn't um, doesn't really appeal to me, but he, I think he was onto something when he said that civilization, the power of it is that it allows people to think beyond the nation state. It allows people to think beyond religious identity, it allows people to think beyond political borders. So there's something in it. And in a sense, it's a kind of way of thinking transnationally. Civilization does that in a sense by definition. And I was kind of trying to return to Toynbee's insight saying, if that's the case, um, then it's an important term for how people map themselves in the world, not just in terms of the space of Europe, let's say if you're living in France and how you relate to the rest of Europe or Eastern Europe, but also in terms of your location in history, in terms of how you, you know, see your particular time and place as being um, you know, of importance. And we, one thing that took me a while to understand is that this discussion of civilization almost always flash up in moments of danger. In other words, it's not, you know, times of peace and prosperity, people don't talk about it all that much. They certainly talk about when they feel there's a threat. Uh, so, you know, there's something that needs to be defended and saved. And so, you know, then since part of the interest of this book was to try to talk about that and that in a sense, how that mapped on to kind of uh, various kind of fears and hopes of people. But it's, it's a term I allowed to, uh, to run across borders in the sense, try to follow out those discussions. And again, spend some time thinking about the organization to give myself some case studies that they could be then um, doable because uh, otherwise it would have just floated away from me completely. So I kind of found what I felt to be kind of controversial case studies in which I could do a kind of rounded study of them and then would move on to the next one. But it, um, so those idea of kind of borders, uh, it just depended on the discussion. It's a very bordered sense when they talk about Christian civilization, much less when let's say UNESCO is talking about world civilization as a kind of effort to, to have a kind of borderless ecumenical world. So it really depended on the speaker group and dependent on the time and what they actually meant by that. Okay, now, now I'm going to group two questions. Uh, the first from Marlene Wilson. Uh, is there a difference between what historians would call an ancient civilization and the way the word is, is now used to define, in quotes, or base how a particular society sees itself? That's the first question. The second from Glenn Penny. Can you say a few words about where you see the greatest consensus across political and theoretical borders during what you called Europeans' efforts to salvage older cultural traditions. Were those consistent across the entire period? Uh, the first question was about, was it the role of ancient civilizations? I wasn't quite sure um, about that. <clears throat> is there a difference between what historians would call an ancient civilization and the way the word is used now to define or base how a particular society sees itself? I mean, again, it depends on who's talking, but I certainly when they talk about ancient civilization as being, you know, a set of values, a set of cultural achievements, uh, kind of norms, uh, ways of life, you know, clothing, food, cities, um, I think I could, that kind of rounded sense of civilization as a kind of, um, uh, as, a, as a kind of uh, you know, larger cultural identity, I think that's not so different in the way that people would describe that today. Um, but what, what, what was interesting about the book is that the discussion of, let's say, classical civilization uh, was important. And of course, for archeologists and others, they, they were very keen to, to maintain that link. But the, but the religiously inflected idea of civilization was much, much stronger in terms of the idea of uh, religious origins. And during the Cold War, the idea of the kind of Christian West and this very strong Cold War term of the idea of a Judeo Christian civilization. It's a kind of hyphenated term that brings together both, you know, Catholics, Protestants, and Jews, uh, and what was called a kind of tri-faith America, but also something that was a kind of strong, uh, kind of united front against the godless East. That was actually very, very important. So um, ancient civilizations is seen as a kind of bedrock. 
it mattered a great deal, let's say, when you know Truman's talking about Western civilization uh, uh, after the Greek Civil War in terms of that the U.S. is now kind of um, uh, taking the, baton, uh, the, 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 the baton from Europe as now kind of guardian of this idea of Western civilization. So uh, they certainly look back toward the past, but um, it's often, I found, at least for the Cold War period, the, the religious and the Christian past actually mattered much, much more. Glenn, the, qu the question about the, whether it's the consensus, uh, not really. I mean, that's the thing. Um, I think what I found interesting about this book is the, the, the kind of fractures, that these would, would be kind of moments of mobilization in which people rally around a particular cause or a kind of a event um, or a, a controversy, but then how quickly that kind of moved into other things. I mean, this, this Christian element, for example, was very, very strong. It was there, but essentially faded and then gets uh, reinvigorated, uh, at least especially in the Catholic context under John Paul II, when he, when he was very explicit about the idea that the Catholic Church stands for an idea of civilization. So um, it's, it's not really a book that in a sense plots out um, kind of consensus lines. It's in a sense why uh, the discussion again flashes up around moments of perceived danger and then the next kind of mo uh, uh, danger controversy, it moves on to that one. So in a sense, I was kind of uh, putting together a kind of um, set of, uh, of, you know, um, again, like I said, kind of controversies, debates, and reform initiatives around that defense. But it's not to say uh, it's kind of red line running from 45 to the present. There's a question from Avi Rosenzweig. Um, has anyone done work on the revival of pilgrimage routes as a way for religion slash spiritualism and rising individualism to do an end run around the state institutions, institutional uh, distinctions. So I wasn't quite get. So the idea of using pilgrimages, the, the, the sound went out for a second. I didn't hear that. <clears throat> yeah, I'll reread. <clears throat> has anyone, and this may, may go beyond what, what you've worked on. Um, has anyone done work on the revival of pilgrimage routes as a way for religion slash spiritualism and rising individualism to do an end run around state institutions slash, in, slash institutional distinctions? Um, I, I'm not sure. I mean, you certainly get with uh, recent work on, let's say, Monica Black in particular, but a range of others, uh, Yulia Komska, about kind of miracle sightings, um, uh, kind of miraculous statuary, the kind of, um, and partly there was some of that was linked to the kind of fate of Christianity on the other side of, of the Iron Curtain in terms of uh, the status of churches and icons um, and in terms of the idea of a, it's, it's, it's not a pilgrimage in terms of they actually can't go to these places, but they certainly will map out a kind of Christian geography, uh, that this is an area that is lost to the Christian world in terms of, uh, um, you know, the kind of loss of, of Christian Eastern Europe. And this language, of course, be really ratcheted up after the Chinese Revolution of 1949, the idea of the kind of loss of, 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 uh, of Christian China. And there's a kind of feeling which the, the, the Christian world is under siege uh, from kind of world communism. But I'm not really sure in terms of the pilgrimage routes. I mean, you certainly get that with um, Lourdes, Lourdes and, and mopping in a couple of those, those old 19th century uh, pilgrimage sites are, um, are certainly very strong in the 1950s and 60s. And there's lots of discussion about those. Um, matter of fact, there's a little point if you remember from the film La Dolce Vita, in which is a kind of miracle sighting uh, in that film. Uh, so there's a way in which it's actually quite an important part of popular culture in the 50s and 60s. But whether that maps on exactly to ideas of civilization, I just kind of touched on it a couple of chapters, but I didn't see any direct evidence, but it could very well be that it's out there. Okay, um, <clears throat> we have currently two more questions. They're very different. Um, I'll read the first one. Uh, this is really calling your gifts as, as, as a historian into, in, into uh, uh, strong demand today. Um, would you talk a bit about the Marshall Plan in the context of the concepts of your book? Do I? Is that the question? No, would you? Would you talk a bit about the Marshall Plan in the context of the concepts of your book? Um, I did a little bit. I mean, again, it was against the background of the justification for the Truman Doctrine, the idea of, of pouring a lot of American money now into the kind of rebuilding of, in that case, 
southeastern Europe, um, as the British made clear they couldn't then um, uh, control the area. And so they often use this idea of Western civilization, but even people like George Keenan uh, were quite clear to say that, uh, that uh, to justify American presence, it has to be in, a in the name of a much larger political cause. And so the kind of defense of civilization, Western civilization in particular, became a kind of go-to language during that. So the Marshall Plan was seen as a kind of story, obviously, of American largesse, uh, the remaking of Europe. Um, uh, whether the Marshall Plan administrators on the ground saw it that way, I'm not sure, but certainly the, the headline stories, this is in a sense um, kind of American, American largest kind of charity uh, kind of designs on the reconstruction of Europe, all part of the broader re-civilization of Europe in the name of peace and prosperity. Again, some of the kind of larger figures associated that with obviously Truman Keenan, Marshall, not really sure, but I don't think in terms of the actual uh, initiatives on the ground. It was a language that mattered all that much, but it was, again, part of this kind of rhetorical arsenal in the period, in a sense, helped make a case to the American public on why there, a lot of their tech is actually going to the reconstruction of Europe. So they said there has to be a broader uh, story on, and that was, in a sense, the idea that the U.S. is now kind of leading the way as a champion of Western civilization. That will cost time, uh, money, treasure, and people to, in a sense, defend that particular ideal. <clears throat> Question from Sarah Halpern. Thinking about conquests involving missionaries and sexual relations with native women and quote unquote, civilizing missions of the 19th century and the ways used Mayan slash Aztec slash Inca civilization and African civilization when we teach, how do we reconcile this contradiction to our students? Uh, the contradiction in terms of what some of the things I'm talking about and how it's linked to its 19th century inheritance. Um, I mean, certainly we're all aware of the language and action of civilizing missions, just how brutal and violent and racist that uh, was. Uh, and in many ways, there are certainly lots of echoes of that around. There's no denying that and all of us that that teach and talk about the 19th century, you know, can't and shouldn't deny that story. But in a sense, what I was trying to get at, and I start, I'm sure it's the case with certain Christian missionaries in that period that had a different idea of that, uh, one that was uh, nonviolent and was uh, more inclusive um, and, uh, and, and different. In a sense, I was just trying to write a history in terms of that moment from 45 in which these things are all, open, they're in a sense, open and up for grabs in terms of it was a full acknowledgement of the collapse of civilization 1945 in the wake of Nazism and the war. Then the question is, if we're going to reconstruct it, why and what values actually matter and you know, toward what end? So I was interested in that, that huge sense of possibility. Now again, um, I thought about actually being in the story 1919 as obviously you know, that's a huge sense of, uh, of Western collapse there too, but it doesn't have the kind of magnitude or the kind of um, the kind of broadness of discussion, li literally living in ruins as people did in 1945. So in a sense, I decided to try to keep it under control by starting the story from 45 with a lot of loopbacks uh, to the interwar years and back to that uh, kind of violent 19th century uh, legacy that you spoke about in the question. Okay, uh, Lisa Kirschenbaum asks, does civilization, quote unquote, play a role in commemorations of World War II? Um, I haven't seen it. Uh, I really, really haven't. Uh, I mean, you're an authority on, on these, uh, on kind of film and so you, knew, you may know yourself. I haven't seen any of that. So uh, I, I looked, you know, high and low for a lot of these things. And there's certain points where they were just kind of dead ends. And so I just kind of left them there. Now it's not to say that it's, it's not possible, but I just didn't, I just didn't really see it. Um, I, I should make this clear. I'm not an advocate for the term. Um, I was in a sense, as an historian, just trying to see how it worked. Uh, we have lots of histories of things like, you know, as John said at the beginning, democracy, history of race, fascism. Now we talk about white privilege as key concepts. It's interesting that civilization, for whatever reason, has not been, uh, has not garnered the same kind of historical scrutiny. And I think it's actually a very, very powerful term, was and is. And I think it deserves a lot more uh, historical analysis. So. Uh, the idea was, in a sense, to kind of 
start a discussion about something that uh, some people argued died in 1945. It did not, a uh, certain conception of it did, but there was a very, very strong effort to kind of reboot it and, uh, and to replace it in the world. And I was in a sense just trying to track why so many people cared about it for so long. And I just think it was a, a one that, um, you know, I was trying to in a sense capture uh, why it mattered to so many people uh, for decades and still does. Well, um, let me see. I think we're close to the end. I'll just maybe say what, what I really admired about, about the, the book is that, so you have this very contested term and there are obvious temptations to use it in particular ways. One of moral outrage, how civilization is a cover for something else. One of, of complete irony and detachment, whereas you know we, we can't expect anything meaningful to come out of this word at all, right? And the other one is the more recent um, tendency you've seen on the right, which is to celebrate it almost unthinkingly. Um, and this is, this is in fact, goes in, I, I think, in kind of cycles. I was amazed to see Hugh Seton Watson in the late, late 60s, I think, come as, 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 as a kind of advocate for this you know, kind of interpretation. But you, so you managed to, to stay above all those options, not to fall into any of those ruts, and, as it were, and to convince readers, I think, that it really is a very important organizing concept. Um, maybe even, you know, because of its range, um, I asked at the beginning about humanity, probably in some ways more, more, more important, more, more powerful, right? Um, <clears throat> maybe I'll just cl close with one, one comment slash um, question, which is, um, when thinking about, and this, this gets to Lisa's question to some extent about the early post-war years and thinking about the wartime, obviously people couldn't say that we're starting from, from Stunde Null, we're starting from nothing <clears throat> in 1945, we're building upon something. And that has a relation to how one sees the war experience as uh, you know, itself. And there's a question about whether the war uh, could destroy civilization if there's something like it, right? Whether, whether it really could devastate it completely and whether maybe civilization in a, in a sense of human decency, which is kind of a synonym, uh, was more tenacious than we give it credit for. And so people who would argue that at the same time, we're of course arguing that maybe Nazism or fascism hadn't had quite the deep impact that some of its critics allege. And I was thinking of this post-war film about the, you know, the Opel car that um, I think it's 1945 or 46, it's one of the early post nachkriegs films. There's an Opel car that goes through the war. Um, and at the end, one of the final scenes, it's, it's about a young woman in Berlin who behaves despite everything decently and gives shelter to a Jewish neighbor which when I see the movie, I always think, um, it's called in Jenen Tagen, I think the film, or in Jenen Zeiten. I always think this is complete fiction. This is not, not the way Berlin was in 1944, 1945, but maybe for the sake of civilization at that moment, it was important to sort of pretend or recover that kind, that kind of humani humanity, I'm using the word humanity, or decency, or you know, sort of deeper layer of civilization from, 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 that, from the war. It's, in other words, it's, there's a mythology ab ab about somehow civilization being tenacious um, that, that, that um, may, may block our sensitivity to some, some darker um, truths about the war itself. Anyway, I throw that out as, as kind of a thought slash comment. Um, okay, can I just quickly comment on that or no? Do sure. Time or no? Um, okay. I think that's, I think that's, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I think a minute or two, and then we'll probably turn over, turn you over to the graduate students for some real tough questions. <laughs> okay, um, I forgot to answer the question you asked about humanity. I think it's true, and I have actually published some on this, the idea of humanity and how the term, and I just thought for a while that it would be one that runs in parallel tracks, but civilization seemed to do a lot more political work, and so in a sense, I followed that out, but, you know, civilizations are you know, it's, it's not that old a term, it's a, it's a few centuries. It's really associated with kind of the French enlightenment. Uh, it's changed a great deal over the centuries. And so, but it's still not to say that it won't, it won't keep changing. Um, you know, I think it's kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's mutated and certainly in the period that I'm looking at, it really undergoes enormous change. When I was finishing the book, I, I was actually quite pessimistic because it seemed like it become such an important monopoly of the radical right in terms of uh, driving forward really xenophobic racist policies. But there's been another discussion I've noticed um, recently actually with the pandemic in which uh, there's a discussion about the defense of planetary civilization and the idea that this is a moment in which scientists and public health officials across the globe need to actually pool the resources and find a solution through this. It's not about the kind of nation states. And so the idea of kind of defense 
of planetary civilization, which you had with Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there's already a sense in which the kind of planetary vulnerability, that's in a sense a very different kind of language. And environmentalists and environmental historians have been talking about the idea of sustainable civilization in a very different way. That's not a kind of vertical hierarchy of kind of cultures or groups, but very much about a kind of species specific kind of planetary uh, membership and that, you know, we need to you know, think about a sustainable civilization. So it could very well be the language moves into that area. Uh, and in a sense, a story of kind of a uh, peace, uh, uh, sustainability uh, and the defense of the planet. So it could very well be that that acts to be for the 21st century in a very important uh, kind of variant on where the word starts to go. So it's, um, it's again, it was an open, open-ended history in 1945. I think it still ends one that's, that's quite open-ended. And it, um, I don't think it's a term that we, um, I think we should take seriously. And I think we'll be around for quite a while, just in a very, very different guise is my guess. Well, thank you very much. So what we've seen, what we've been talking about is the first edition of your book. <laughs> yeah. <What do> you, <laughs> right. Great. Well, that, that was wonderful, Paul. Thank you so much. Thanks to everyone uh, who participated today um, for, for, for our session. Uh, so I'm going to adjourn the meeting. Um, I think, do I have the power to do that? I'm not sure. But in any case, it's 11 o'clock and you need to go into another meeting. So again, thanks very much. Uh, Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, John, for the comments. Well.